It's a joy to be with all of you young adults and your leaders this evening as we are seated in the newly renovated and beloved tabernacle, along with those of you who have gathered in the stake centers near and far and who are viewing these proceedings by means of satellite transmission. I'm, I think I'm more comfortable than you are. <laughs> I remember when I used to sit in those seats. <laughs> and when the tabernacle was remodeled, they weren't made any softer. <laughs> We're, we're delighted to see you all, you wonderful young men and women, and uh, we're grateful for you and appreciate uh, the fact that you want to go forward and do what's right and accomplish the things which the Lord would have you accomplish in your lives. And uh, you young ladies need to seem to know what you're doing and want to do, and, and the young men are learning what they ought to do. <laughs> I'd just like to say one word to you young men. Don't take too much counsel from your fears. I'll think about that. Uh, I'm grateful to have Sister Faust here with me. Uh, when we decided to get married, <clears throat> I told her that I needed her help and that uh, I needed to get more schooling and uh, we would appreciate her support. <clears throat> And I can honestly say that she gave that support and much, much more and made it possibly possible for me to do some of the things that I've done in my life. I guess I should say to you that marriage involves uh, having a helpmeet and those years and still uh, Sister Vows has been very much my best help me. Tonight I'd like to talk about self-esteem. What we think of ourselves, how we relate to others, what they think of us, and the value of what we accomplish. An unknown Englishman of early days offered this prayer. Oh, God, help me hold a high opinion of myself. That, said President Harold V. Lee, of the Englishman's plea should be the prayer of every soul, not an abnormally developed self-esteem that becomes haughtiness, conceit, or arrogance, but a righteous self-respect that might be defined as belief in one's own worth, worth to God and worth to man. Indeed, the self-esteem that I speak of this morning is, this evening is not blind or arrogant or vain self-love, but rather a self-esteem that is self-respecting, honest and without conceit, and is born of inner peace and strength. Self-esteem goes to the very heart of our personal growth and accomplishment. It's the glue that holds together our self-reliance, our self-control, our self-approval or disapproval, and keeps all self-defense mechanisms secure. It is a protection against excessive self-deception, self-distrust, self-reproach, and plain, old-fashioned selfishness. 
In my long life, I have observed that the greatest respect is owed not necessarily to the rich, nor the famous, but to the quiet, unsung, unknown heroes whose true identity is like that of the unknown soldier who is known only to God. The unsung often have little of status, but much of worth. When I was growing up in the Cottonwood area of Salt Lake County, it was a rural part of the valley. One of the men who had the greatest dignity and commanded the greatest respect was an old Scandinavian brother who, after walking a couple of miles, traveled by streetcar to work at the Salt Lake City Cemetery and back every day. His work was to water and mow the grass and tend the flowers and dig the graves. He said little because he did not speak English well, but he was always where he should be, doing what he should be doing in a most dignified and exemplary way. He had no problems with ego or with faith, for while he dug graves for a living, he felt his work was to serve God. He was a man of little status, but of great, great worth. When the Savior called his disciples, he was not looking for men and women of status, property, or fame. He was looking for those of worth and potential. They were an interesting group, those early disciples, the fishermen, the tax gatherer, and the others. After they were called to be apostles, they did not become puffed up or think they were superior. On one occasion, after some of them had been beaten, they went on their way, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Worth has little to do with age. It has everything to do with service. The Lord has made it clear that worthiness is built upon service, not just to family and friends, but also to strangers and even enemies. From Milton's Paradise Lost comes this truth. <clears throat> Oft times nothing profits more than self-esteem grounded on just and right, well managed. I would like to suggest six essential keys to keep a healthy self-esteem. The first key is to keep your free agency. This means that you must not surrender self-control, nor yield to habits that bind, to addiction that enslaves, nor to conduct that destroys. To keep our free agency, we must avoid the deadly traps and pitfalls from which there can be sometimes no escape. Some have been ensnared and spent the best years of their lives trying to escape and so exhaust themselves in the process that even in the end, even though have, they have ultimately found themselves freed from the addiction, they are spent, burned out, nerve shot, and their brains dulled forever. How much better off we would be and how much more complete our free agency if we were able to say with the psalmist, I have refrained my feet from every evil. The second key to an adequate self-esteem is humility. I do not mean the breast-beating sackcloth and ashes kind of humility. I mean the humility that comes with inner strength and peace. It is the humility that allows us to accept and live with our own warts without cosmetics to hide them. It is important to learn to live with our uncorrectable physical and mental defects without complaint or explanation. Some months ago, I had a back operation. I've never been the same since. I may never be, but the first time that I spoke over in the conference center with a little pulpit like this. 
One of my granddaughters said, Oh, Grandpa, you look so comfortable up there. I just wanted to come up and crawl on your lap. Some years ago, I became acquainted with a delightful and wonderful new friend. He is a successful businessman, charming, outgoing, and well-groomed. His spirituality shines through his countenance. A few months later, I noticed a slight limp in his walk, which had not been obvious before. That led to a closer observation. When I looked past the gracious smile, I noticed that my friend was slightly hunchback, with a somewhat misshapen spine. These physical defects were so well hidden by the natural goodness, warmth, and great charm, they were as nothing in the total man. My friend accepts his physical defects with humility and strength and completely compensates for them with his natural personality. There is another dimension of humility that must be mentioned, that of being teachable. The prophet Samuel counsels, Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you. Proverbs reminds us that whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge. The third key to self-esteem is honesty. Honesty begins with being true to one's own self. Some years ago, I sat in a spec as a spectator in a heart-rending courtroom drama concerning the custody of some children. The contention was that the natural mother was not a good housekeeper, which was intended to add fuel to the claim that she was an unfit mother. The caseworker attested that when she visited the family home, it was in a shambles and that the kitchen was dirty. The natural mother seeking to keep custody of her children was called to the witness stand. A middle-aged, heavy, physically unattractive lady came forward, took the oath, and sat in the witness stand. The attorney for the father, who had remarried and wanted the custody of the children, followed up relentlessly on the testimony already provided by the caseworker. His questions to the beleaguered mother were penetrating. Isn't it a fact, he asked? that your house was as dirty as a pig pen the day the caseworker came? What drama! How could the mother answer in her own best interest and protect the custody of her children? What should she say? There was electricity in the air. She hesitated for a tense moment, and then she responded calmly with complete self-assurance. Yes. My house was sure certainly a mess that day. The honesty of her answer surprised even the judge, and he leaned over the bench and asked, What do you mean that day? Well, Your Honor, she replied earlier that morning, when the caseworker came, I had been bottling peaches. I had peeled, cooked, and bottled two bushels of peaches. I had not finished cleaning up the mess when the caseworker came. My sink was still sticky from the syrup that I had spilled over it that I was trying to pour into the bottles before they were sealed. My house certainly was a mess that day. I tried to be a good housekeeper with three children. I can't possibly keep it straight all of the time. Her frankness and candor was absolutely disarming and devastating to the opposition. When she finished speaking, everyone in the courtroom knew what, that the judge would rule in her favor. As she arose to step down from the witness stand, she had the bearing and self-assurance of a queen. Being true to one's own self is the essence of honesty and the keystone of self-esteem. The fourth key of self-esteem is the love of work. The most gifted athlete at our university excelled in every sport. He played football, ran the hurdles. In fact, he held the conference records in the low hurdles. Our coach, Ike Armstrong, required that the sprinters 
run once a week with the quarter milers for 300 yards to increase the stamina of the sprinters and increase the speed of the quarter milers. My friend, this great athlete, would lead all of the runners for about 275 yards. But as soon as the first quarter miler passed him, he would quit. He wouldn't even finish. His natural talent and ability was such that he never had to extend himself to excel. He was married, but the marriage failed. He went into professional football and was something of a star until he got into the drug scene and died from a debilitating of drugs and alcohol. Others with much less talent have achieved far more. In my experience, there are very few people who are of true genius. While there are those who are gifted, most of the world's work and some of the greatest contributions come from the ordinary people with a talent which they have developed. An ordinary garden variety talent can be nurtured and nourished into a great gift through hard work. Some of the artisans of China spend years making just one exquisite object of art of unbelievable grace and beauty. We do not all have a talent for the arts, such as painting, sculpture, music. There are many gifts that are not showcased. Some may have a natural gift to make others feel important and happy and special. Such a gift should be developed and strengthened. Spiritual gifts likewise can be refined and enlarged by attentive application to righteous living, to prayer, to study of the scriptures, and obedience. George Lucas has said, it doesn't matter what people say about me or what I say, what matters is what I accomplish. What we accomplish helps our self-esteem. Sometimes we may think the work I do is unimportant or I'm only this or that. Every job that has to be done is important, no matter how minimal it seems. Someone has to do it. The fifth key to building self-esteem is the ability to love. The commandment given by the Savior was to love others and yourself. I am secure enough in my love of myself to laugh at myself. Am I secure enough to admit my mistakes and graciously accept a compliment? Am I secure in my love of others to smile and say hello to a perfect stranger? Years ago in seminary, our class was taught, I have to live with myself, and so I want to be fit for myself to know. I want to go out with my head erect. I want to de demand all men's respect. I can never hide myself from me. I see what others may never see. I can never fool myself, and so whatever happens, I want to be self-respecting and conscious-free. The sixth and most essential key to self-esteem is the love of God. Mosiah reminds us, how knoweth the man the master whom he has not served? In Paul's epistle to Titus, he reminds us that there are many that profess they know God, but in works they deny him. The Apostle John gives us a valuable key, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. And then John makes an important point about obedience when he states, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He hath said, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. There are many whose self-esteem has been so devastated by the loss of loved ones, by divorce, or other personal misfortunes. Some carry an extra burden of guilt from grievous sins. 
transgression is so devastating to self-esteem. After transgression, and so often comes rationalization and even lying. This is what makes justice so violent to the offender. Fortunately, we have a great principle of repentance whereby sins that are as scarlet can become white as snow. I'm grateful for this principle and pray none will hesitate to find peace that comes from repentance. It is important to remember and never forget that all of us, male and female, were created in the image of God and created by God. Mankind is the noblest of all creations. What is man, asked the psalmist, that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory. And thou hast made him to have a dominion over the works of the hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet. Frequently in my ministry, as I've set apart a stake president or a mission president, the distinct impression has come to me that the person upon whose head I have laid my hands was foreordained to that calling. The prophet Jeremiah had this assurance come to him from the Lord. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. All of us are not called to leadership in the kingdom, yet is there greater work than that of being a teacher, father, mother? So nobody is nobody. The seeds of divinity are in us all. The day will come when we will have to account to God for what we have done with that portion of divinity which is within us. Now, it's a lovely evening and it would be very nice for you young people to have some time to spend with each other. And so, I'm going to conclude. And then I want to teach you something else that I taught the General Authorities in conference. Meetings do not have to be endless to be eternal. <laughs> now I testify that God loves each of us, warts and all. I testify that he knows each of our names. And I testify that each of us has a potential in this life. And beyond the grave there, that exceeds our fondest dreams. I testify through the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we are engaged in his holy work. And I wish to invoke an apostolic blessing of heaven upon all and that we may come to know who we truly are, the sons and daughters of God. And I should like to invoke a blessing upon you. And it is the blessing that the Lord gave to Nephi But I'm going to substitute each of your names, Bill and Henry and Catherine and Helen, all of you, each one of you. <laughs> Blessed art thou, Bill and Henry and all of you, <laughs> for those things which thou hast done. For I have beheld how thy hast with such unweariness declared the word which I have given unto thee, unto this people. And thou hast not feared them, and hast not sought thine own life, but hast sought my will, and to keep my commandments. Now here comes the blessing. 
And because thou hast done this with such unweariness, behold, I will bless thee forever. And I will make thee mighty in word, in deed, in faith, and in works. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.